this beautiful day, this hand bell Sunday. You know, I thought about Louie and me bringing some bells up here and doing our part during worship, but I don't think it would be that pretty. So I'm so glad that the, the beautiful people in the hand bell choir and Sean are taking care of all that good work. You know, last week we talked about something that I wrestle with each and every day, and that's that concept of Christian patience. But I also talked about how those tedious and frustrating moments of waiting can sometimes be sacred spaces and sacred seasons where we can learn to deepen our trust in the Lord, where we can draw closer to Him in that time of indecision, and where we can start to listen for His will and His plan for our lives as we seek His beautiful guidance. And this week I'm going to talk about God's commandments and how they can serve as reminders of the Lord's wisdom and love and a, a road map that keeps us on track as we face a life full of transitions and surprises and obstacles. Instead of what some people see God's commandment as, they're unnecessary to some people, they're restrictive rules that impede our personal freedoms. So as I talk about especially that first great commandment today, we're going to look at them and talk about them as promises from God. They're trustworthy, true, and good promises from God that talks about us in, in not in a harsh regulatory way, but in a, a way of love to keep our feet walking in the right direction. You know, so many people have misinterpreted and misrepresented the Ten Commandments and all those other ordinances of God we find in Holy Scripture. Some see them as barriers that limit people's right to figure out this thing called life on their own. I love surveys. I love statistics. I've gone to view surveys and statistics throughout my career, and that's flowed into my ministry. And I was reading a recent Pew Research Center survey, and it said that far more Presbyterians in our denomination say that they really don't see right and wrong as definite black and white things. To them, they say that good and bad, the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do are things we can figure out, that we can work out on our own. 34% of the surveyed people said that there are clear standards. There is right and wrong, definitive things that we should live by in our lives. But it also said that 62% of the people surveyed said that each particular situation dictates the actions we should take. So in other words, that's called situational ethics. There is no real right. There is no wrong. The situation tells us how we should respond. Also, 59% of the people surveyed said that they're guided as to what is right and wrong by reason or philosophy or science or even common sense, but not by their religious teachings or doctrine. And 24% of the people in our denomination, this blew my mind, 24% say that the Bible is not even the Word of God. So it seems that for many people across the nation and our group, God's word isn't that important or necessary as this source of absolute truth or moral guidance. It seems that many people think they can make up their mind on their own as to what's right and wrong, and they don't want God to be in their way. You know, when I read all this, I was shocked at first. I was really taken aback. But the longer I've thought about it, I'm really not that surprised after all. It seems no one wants to be told what to do anymore, especially in our nation. They don't want silly rules to slow down the goals that they've set for themselves or even the goals that they've set for their worldly leaders to follow. So few people want boundaries to be placed on their freedoms or their rights to enjoy themselves. You know, as I thought about that, I think we've all become like a nation of teenagers. No matter what age we are, we think we know everything about everything, especially what's best for ourselves. And we don't want any parental figure or any fatherly figure to step in and to ruin our good time. But, you know, I promise that God's word, his commandment, and the rules and regulations that he sets for us should actually be considered as a blessing and as gifts. They're signposts and truths to keep us safe as we learn how to walk more closely with the Lord and how to get along with the brothers and sisters that he places around us. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful present that he gives to us to unwrap. It teaches us how to live a harmonious life with the Lord and to live that beautiful, blessed life that he yearns for us to experience. So today we're going to jump right in and discuss the first commandment where God says that we should have no other gods before him. You know, at first glance, this commandment seems so clear to each and every one of us. We're monotheists. We believe in one God. and We're taught to believe in the triune God that consists of Father, Son, and Spirit. 
Most of us have been brought up in the church. We've gone to Sunday school and vacation Bible school. We've sat through countless Christian education groups and Sunday school classes. We've learned about who God is. It seems to be a pretty transparent commandment that we can get our minds around. We may struggle with the other nine commandments, but for the most part, we think we have this one all figured out. But I want us to look at this part of God's covenant a little deeper and a little more closely this morning. You see, this simple commandment is really quite remarkable and unique. No other Near Eastern religion had such a bold foundational statement in their law. To the contrary, in that culture, many different gods were worshipped. People didn't have one deity that they revered, one deity that they respected or spoke to in their prayers. Many gods were out there to appease and to satisfy. So literally, as we look at this passage for today, God is saying that we're to have no other gods against our face or no other God before our face. Friends, this is a startling call that we're supposed to proclaim and worship our God directly. Our stare, our full attention, and our allegiance must be set on our God and our God alone. You know, the Israelites had been living in exile. They were exposed to other religious groups who set their gaze on those multitude of deities. So soon after God brought them out of bondage across the Red Sea, bringing them into the wilderness as they awaited a time they would enter that promised land, he spoke to Moses. God passed on his rules and regulations and instructions in the form of the Ten Commandments so that the people of God would have these basic building blocks of faith to lead them on their journey, to prepare them for the free life they were promised in that promised land. Again, this law wasn't a harsh requirement or, or an unjust set of rules by a king. No, it was a gift from the Lord who wanted what's best for all of his dear children. The first and greatest lesson he gave to them was to know that he alone was their God. He's setting the stage, the base for all that he's going to teach them about his identity and his might, his plan for humanity, and his unimaginable love. This instructional gift allows the children of God to find clarity in a world that is so, so cloudy and confusing and hazy at times. It lets us find where we are in the grand purpose of God. It lets us struggle with and then find answers to what we've always wanted to know. It protects us. It teaches us about God's guidance. God is the one who actually speaks to us. He's the one who loves us. He's the one who only saves and delivers us. His word tells us that he is the one that we're supposed to obey and worship. With all the confusion the Israelites were to face as they moved through the wilderness, God gave them that first commandment to get their feet on firm ground and to root them in his protective love. It's important to note also that all the other commandments stand on the first. That is the base. That is the groundwork of all that we're going to learn about God's commandments. None of us, friends, can live or benefit from the other commandments if we don't first acknowledge and give ourselves to the one true God. We can't rightly worship or speak of or obey or revere or honor God the Father, Son, and Spirit if other gods have entered our lives and grabbed our attention. We can't respect our parents or the people that are around us in authority. We can't value or protect marriage or beautiful relationships. We can't honor the lives of others or their property. We can't speak truthfully about our sisters and brothers or be content with the things that we have in life unless we believe there is one true Lord. Our passage from Isaiah chapter 44 expands again on the first commandment. At this point in the history of the Israelites, the people had the law. They knew his commandments, but friends, they continued to stray. Wealth and power and selfishness grabbed at their hearts. And most importantly, idols and false gods caught their attention and lured them away from the Lord. But in God's patience, he tried to warn them through the voice of the bold prophets. He tried to bring them back into him and into his tender care. But they wouldn't listen. So they faced exile and fear, broken relationships and despair because of the reality of their disobedience. God so loved them that he continued to call on them to try to bring them back into his tender care. And he promised that one day he would restore them and reconcile their relationships with him forever. He reminds his disobedient children again that he is their only king. 
He alone will be their Redeemer and Lord. He is the one who made everything in creation. God tells them he is the first and the last, and besides him there is no other true God. All the deities they chased and called upon never could answer them because, friends, they were not real. All the convoluted worship and wayward glances didn't benefit them. It only separated them from a true, deep relationship with the one who graciously reveals his will to his children. God is the only one who speaks to us in his holy word. God is the only one who allows us to have an open conversation with him. God is the one who truly promises us good for our lives and wants what's best for all of us. So God tells them not to be afraid because they've been witnesses firsthand of his glory and his care and might. Throughout their history, he continued to deliver them even though they were obstinate. He reminds them that he is their rock and foundation, and he yearns again for them to come home, to come back into the loving fold. Okay, so once again, we're church people. We think we understand the first commandment, so now you're probably ready to get on with the other nine. But we live in a fast-paced society. We don't have time to linger, but I want you to pause just a little bit, and let's see if we're really clear about what God's saying in this first promise. Are we being single-minded people in our focus and reverence of God? Or we tend to live that double-minded life that you read about in the book of James? What do I mean by that? Is our focus, is our attention fully set on God? Do we walk the walk and talk the talk? Or do we just say what we believe and then go about living our lives as, as other people in the world do? Not showing others that we belong to our Lord. I was reading a quote from Martin Luther and he said... Whatever then thy heart clings to and relies upon, that is properly thy God. Israelites in the wilderness strayed. They needed the first commandment to set those loving boundaries for their journey. And then Judah, centuries later, ran after under gods and other gods. They turned their back to the Lord, and they needed to be turned back around to look at the Lord face to face and to set their stare on him alone. But unfortunately, friends, in our modern world where so many things grab at us and try to control us, I think we desperately need to be reminded that God is God and nothing else can fill that void in our lives. So what's trying to steer us away from our focus and our worship and reliance upon that one true Lord today? Well, for some people, it's become self. For so many people, myself has become my God. It's self-preservation and self-advancement hitting the goals that I want for my career, hitting all the targets I want as a salesman or as a business person. It's all about me. Self-preservation is not a sin. God loves us. God wants us to, to be protected and safe. But making myself better or higher up than God can become an all-consuming idol. People that do that tend to be busy people. They don't have time to listen or much less worship God. They don't want anyone to stand in their way of hitting the mark. They don't need God because they think they can do it all by themselves. Going it alone is replaced or replaces living for the Lord. Family. Family is a blessing. Family is sacred. Family is so important in our lives. But there are some people out there that place family above all else. Nothing, not even worshiping God, can keep them away from time with their family. So they make room for special family events and celebrations, but they forget that God also gave them that gift of family, and he should be at the center of their time together. So they turn their back on God. Idols pop up. Money and, and status and possessions are held in a higher esteem than God. There are people that truly believe that if they accumulate more and more in life, their lives will be filled with com completeness and, and joy. So the next iPhone release becomes a necessity instead of a toy. Many caring folks even place their causes above God. They put all they have into their fight for justice, but they lose touch with the Lord. To many in these heated political times, country or political party become more valuable than the Lord as well. There are people out there that worship their hobbies or their sports or, heaven forbid, their favorite team. Their creator is important to them, but guess what? God is the last thing on their mind when the kickoff happens on a Saturday afternoon. 
It was social media telling us that we're, we're valued by the likes that we receive from a post with advertisers telling us that happiness comes from living the lifestyle of the rich and famous celebrities that we see. And with recreation and self-fulfillment moving ahead from, from being a luxury now to a necessity, our heads are being turned in so many directions and away from the Lord. Again, God wants us to enjoy our lives, our families, our works. But he knows that for us to be truly, truly full in life, we need to cling to him alone. You know, Jesus himself reminds us of that truth in our passage today from Luke's gospel. To have the full life God wants for us, we're called by Christ to reorder our priorities. We're told to put our allegiance in God and put that allegiance above everything else. Now, when we read this and when so many people read this at home, they struggle with this piece of scripture. How in the world can Jesus Christ, the one who tells us to love, love, love everybody out there, how can he also be telling us to hate even the people in our family? But I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. I think he's using a literary technique called hyperbole. He's using an exaggerated statement to make a valuable point to the audience. Christ is shocking the people that gathered around him that day, and he's shocking us as well, trying to teach us that when we begin to experience the kingdom of God, when we yearn to be close to the Lord in the here and now, we need to center our lives on God and let everything else go. So to focus on career or self or possessions or even family, you're missing the mark. Friends, it all begins with our adoration and our love of God as we stand in awe of him. Fulfillment and personal satisfaction with what we have been blessed to receive and positive, strong relationships flow from a life grounded in the Lord. Jesus calls us to count the cost also of building our lives and hopes on whichever foundation we decide in life. Are we going to stand on the foundation that begins with God or are we going to stand on the foundation that's held up by the weak promises of the world? But the life that God wants for us to live is the one that's mirrored by Jesus Christ. It's a life that loves the Lord. It's a life that always has a head turned toward him, an ear open, and an obedient life that heeds his call. It's a rock life built on solid foundations instead of the idols of this world, the false promises of the world out there that will never stand up in the end. If we cling to Jesus, if we truly grab hold of the hand of our Lord, we are promised a life that will exceed our wildest imagination. Friends, that's the gift of the first commandment. We don't have to limp around trying to serve many masters in our lives. We don't have to struggle with all those competing voices trying to determine what's trustworthy and honest or not. Now, all we have to do is to humbly bow before the true God who has shown up in our lives and who continues to show up, showing us his power and love and mercy. He's the one who offers us a new whole life. And even when we fall short, even when we struggle and have our heads turned from time to time, God gave his only son so that we could be forgiven and then brought back into the fold again. Friends, we need to hear and contemplate the first commandment now more than ever. As people stand divided over political party and personal opinions, we need to go to God for direction and answers and for unity. Before we can reconcile with our neighbor, before we can acknowledge the mistakes of the past, before we can truly heal wounds that we thought were too wide to ever be healed, we need to go to God who can unite anything he desires. Unless we believe that God creates all life in his beautiful image, we can't view people who look or speak or live differently than us as beloved, valued children of the Lord. As people argue over personal freedom, saying that they are more important than the need to care for all of God's citizens and all the citizens of our nation, we need to listen to what God tells us to do and give up some of our rights to care and protect other people. There's people out there fight over how to allocate resources to benefit the poor or the marginalized or the needy. We must first proclaim that everything that we have is a gift that's been given by God and then freely share it with other people. Until we realize that we belong to the Lord and then give ourselves to him, we can never freely give ourselves to others and we can't catch a taste of the life that he wants for us as his children. So God said, you shall have no other gods before me. So many other gods and voices turn our heads and block our view of the Lord. 
So let's do a little bit of homework this week. I want you all in your prayer time and your quiet time, think about the false gods or the ideals or the idols that you've made in your life, the, the practices that you may have in your day-to-day -day activities that keep you from following the Lord more fully. Think about everything that blocks you from being unashamedly a disciple of Jesus Christ and being a more faithful person who listens to God and then tries to respond in love. So, dear Lord, may we all be single-minded in our allegiance to you as we ponder the gift of your beautiful law, the truthfulness of your promises, and the joy of your perfect love. I say this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.